Hey everyone. Um, I'll, I'll add a couple more things to the list, just so you, I know if I was your age, uh, I don't know, the title of pastor never really impressed me very much. If anything, it made my radar kind of kick up, go, okay, red flag. So uh, I'll also add, um, uh, before I became a pastor, I've been a pastor here in Kelowna for eight years now. Uh, before I was a pastor, I was a college professor. Um, I was actually the academic dean at the college I worked at for a few years. So I would build the curriculum um, and I taught a number of classes, uh, some general studies classes, but mostly languages and uh, biblical studies courses. So you can add Greek nerd to the list. I think I took Greek for seven years and then taught Greek for a few years. Um, if uh, you're a science fiction or fantasy nerd, I had the, the sweet, sweet opportunity to teach a class on the history of science fiction, which was really, really fun to do as well. Um, but I remember when I was in that context uh, as a student, when I went to, to Bible college and grad school as a student, I actually was fairly annoyed. And I was annoyed because a lot of the stuff that I was hearing was stuff that wasn't reaching me in the pulpit. It was stuff that I'd never heard of or interacted with. And so it's always been uh, um, a mission of mine to try and uh, take the things that scholars and academics are talking about and open people's eyes to it to show that it's uh, not so scary and often brings a, a whole lot of wisdom. So that's where this passion is coming from. I'm not trying to indoctrinate anybody or um, get dogmatic on you. I wanna talk about what this can actually look like. Now, the great thing is there's a really short, simple answer to the question of how do I read my Bible while I'm in university? The answer would be a little bit all the time. That's, that's the easy answer, there you go. Um, this isn't in the, in the, the notes there, there are notes that were put out there. They're in the chat. You can download those. I'll be referencing the outline for the UCM talk. You can look at that. The other ones I can mention, you can take a look at those later, but, um, this isn't in the notes per se, but I remember, uh, growing up, even when I was in college and university, I would, I never spoke about it this way, but I still approached my Bible as though it might somehow be a little bit magic. And I was perpetually disappointed that it wasn't actually magic. Uh, I would read thinking I just had to find that like right posture or position. And then I would have some like stroke of insight or genius and something would happen to me. Um, I have been thankfully relieved of that uh, assumption. And I, I really strongly believe um, and have experienced the fact that if you want to be uh, impacted by scripture, you need to stay in scripture and let it shape you. And that means being patient, being patient and being consistent. Um, if you're working out, the hardest part of a workout is being consistent and having a game plan that you can carry on, whether you're at home or on the road. It's the same thing here. You want to, to have a plan for reading your Bible that you can carry on, whether you're at home, at school, on the road, whatever. And the best thing I can urge for you is to do something um, that you can manage and to keep on doing that thing and let time do the work that's necessary. I remember reading a book by uh, Timothy Keller on prayer. And uh, it was really nice because he was talking about praying through the Psalms and he was very honest. He said, you know, the first couple of years, it wasn't really doing anything for him. <laughs> he was very blunt about that. He was like, yeah, I prayed and prayed and prayed and did it more out of habit than anything. But he said after about two or three years, he noticed somewhere along the way, there's no, there's no like divine moment, but he realized a switch had been flipped and, um, and he was really entering into prayer in a way that he never had before. And the Bible had worked on him. It had shaped him in that period of time. So look at reading your Bible as a practice. Uh, that means when you're approaching it, don't approach it, um, even with the end goal of understanding what you're reading. And that's a very, very hard thing for an adult to do. 
but um, you're focused on reading and being in the word. Um, understanding, uh, scratching those itches, that will come with time. And I'm a big itch scratcher. I'm all about that. So I'm not saying you don't want to lean into things, but I'm saying, let's do baby steps here. You want to just make sure that you read. Uh, anybody worth their salt who talks about how to read the Bible should start with, you just open it and read it. However, uh, some of you might go, well, that's great, but I want a little bit more than that. This is a pretty lame talk, Pastor Levi. Uh, I got all dressed up for nothing. Well, I have other things I can talk about with you. So I understand that you are doing um, a Bible study series on 1 Corinthians. So one of the things I've drawn up for you guys, if you're interested, is just a one page like um, quick and dirty, how do I lead a Bible study where I try and walk through some of the things I'm going to be talking about today. And I've also given you something that I do with every book of the Bible that I read that radically slows down how fast you can read but really helps you um retain what you've read and work with it and so i'll point that out in a second too but first of all uh, let me just say that when we are reading scripture what we are really trying to do is we are reading and listening for the voice of god now that's the part that tied me up when i was younger um, I was listening for the voice of God without even knowing what his voice sounded like or what he looked like. Now, I've been raised in the church, so I assumed that I knew these things and just felt like something was getting in the way of that. And so even though I was a, a Christian, I always had this niggling doubt that the whole thing was broken because nothing was actually working for me. What I've come to realize is that I didn't know God at all. That's one of the things that if you attend a Bible college, you realize pretty quickly is that all the stuff you thought you knew, you didn't actually know and you need a good heaping dose of humility. So when we're reading, what we're really doing is we're listening for the voice of God. But the reason I say you just want to start by reading is because you need to get an understanding of who God is as he is presented in scripture. So one thing that can be helpful in this process is when you read scripture, think about it as um, participating in some kind of an alternative story, an, un an alternative understanding of the way things actually are. And that's really, really important because most of the time when we read the Bible, a lot of people will read it and they'll try and fit the Bible within the framework of the world that they understand. Uh, it's natural, most of us do that. I hear lots of people get up in, in arguments trying to prove scientifically that the Bible is accurate or that God exists or et cetera, et cetera. Um, hang that, you can't do it. Uh, it's a, a waste of time and energy. What you need to recognize is that scripture actually gives you an alternative understanding of everything where God is and God has been revealed in Jesus. And you are trying to wrap your head around that idea. What if there is a God? And what if this God is in fact the God of Israel? And what if this God of Israel has revealed himself in Jesus and he is not just the God of Israel, but he's the God of everything. What if that story is actually true then what? Then what? Now, it takes a while to be able to wrap your head around that approach. But if you can think about that, then you also recognize that what you really need to be doing is reading the world through that story. So now you've got this sense of the story, the sense of the, the, the story of scripture. But now you're taking that story and you're saying, okay, but I have lived my life X number of years understanding the world a certain way. So I'm, now I need to take this biblical story, I almost use it like a pair of glasses and how I look at the world around me and wrestle with the world around me. Now, I'm not going to suggest this is going to give you any kind of certainty. Again, we're talking about humility here. Um, you're looking at these competing narratives of understanding the world, you know, uh, secularism, uh, scientific positivism, naturalism, Christianity, and if you're going to uh, appreciate the world from any one of these standpoints, you have to dive all in. You have to go all in. And that takes some time. But if God has been revealed in Christ, if this story is a story that we take to be true as Christians, then what now? What happens now? And this is where I, I say we have to actually let ourselves be read by Scripture. We have to let Scripture inform us 
as to what it means to be human, uh, what it means to live in the world, what it means to be a part of a community, and how we respond to all the things around us. Now, I'm aware in teaching many, many classes that I can say something and I can be thinking that I'm communicating one thing, but people who are listening to me uh, can take a whole variety of interpretations uh, from things I've just said. So when I say that the Bible is uh, a story that we take to be true and that it has to shape us, I do not mean that we need to model our lives after what we read in scripture. And here's why I don't mean that. Because the peoples that we read about in scripture and the word of God that we hear being received and confirmed in scripture is something that is being received by people who lived on the other side of the planet 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 plus years ago. God is not calling us to look like a Jew from the fourth, uh, from, from the fourth millennia BC nor is he asking us to look like a, a Greek Christian from the first century. What he is asking us to look like is to look like we are made in his image in our present context. In our present context. So we are not modeling necessarily what we see in scripture. Um, sorry, we, 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 are, we are modeling. We're not conforming to what we see in scripture. So when I say modeling, I mean we're modeling what we see the people of God doing with their relationship with God, with their understanding of God along the way. So a great example is Paul. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, is taking this Jewish story, this old Jewish story that has uh, reached its climax in Jesus, and he's saying, okay, but how does this story have any bearing on the life of a Corinthian Christian wrestling with the things that they're wrestling with, navigating uh, the complexities of life as they are navigating them. What does this story have anything to do with or anything to say to them? And then he, he, he works to translate that story into their context. And the first thing he says actually to every Gentile he meets is whatever a Gentile Christian looks like, they don't look like a Jewish Christian. Jewish Christians look like Jewish Christians. Gentile Christians should look different. And the question is, what does a Gentile Christian look like? And so when we read Paul's letters, he's, he's wrestling with really like on the ground, in the trenches kinds of things. Uh, questions that kind of maybe even shock our sensibilities sometimes as to how a church that has been around for three years could be dealing with this thing that they're dealing with. For example, in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul hears that somebody in the church has been sleeping with his father's wife. Um, this is an issue, and it's an issue that Paul brings up publicly because apparently the entire church knew about it, and no one was speaking to the problem. Because as far as they were concerned, there wasn't really a problem, and Paul has to translate that Jewish story into this Gentile context, this Corinthian context. Now, we are doing the same thing that Paul is doing. We are trying to take this, this ancient story that includes the New Testament story, and we're trying to say, okay, all this is true. So how do I translate it into my context? So I have super high-tech graphic here for you. This is in the slide. This is one of my kids' uh, whiteboards. Here's what often happens, okay? So J, that's J for Jesus. What often happens, I'm just going to put NT. The NT there stands for New Testament. What often happens with, uh, with believers, not just young believers, but young believers often get pegged with this, but really a lot of people in our current um, spiritual slash religious climate, they feel like, you know, I'm not so much about uh, the church, but I'm all about Jesus. So what they are thinking is, I really want Jesus. So I'm just going to skip this whole bible thing this whole religion thing this is jesus here in time and culture time and culture has advanced and moved forward i'm just going to skip this this whole thing um, and get to jesus that way the problem with that is that is not how jesus has been revealed to us jesus has been revealed to us 
through the testimony of scripture. Now we might say that I became a believer because my, uh, of my parents, because of a youth pastor or a close friend or what have you. But at some point in time, that chain of connection breaks down and lands up here, scripture. If we want to know who Jesus is, the only way that we can do that is through engaging with scripture. Now you've got some people who say, okay, I'm going to engage with scripture and I'm just going to do exactly what I think it's telling me to do. The Bible says that women should have their heads covered when they're engaging in worship. Ergo, any church that does not have women covering their heads in worship is not a church that I will be going to. Or the Bible says, Women should be quiet in services and not speak. Ergo, women should not be in any kind of spiritual leadership. I'm just copying what the Bible says. There's a big problem here, though. Repeating what something says word for word is not interpreting the thing. You're just parroting something without any understanding. So both of these models don't actually help, because this one here assumes that God is calling us all to be first century gentile slash jewish christians but when you look at this group of people in the new testament what you realize is there's great diversity in the new testament itself between what believers can actually look like so what i'm suggesting instead is all right my jay's looking a little anemic there right now what I'm suggesting instead is if we want to understand who Jesus is, the only way that we can really do that is by addressing church history, addressing scripture, addressing Jesus as Jesus is presented in all of these things. That's the only way that we can do that. This is why we say constantly, you should be engaged in your Bible. It's not because you're going to find some golden nugget that no one has ever seen before. It's because we want, we want believers to come to a deeper and deeper and deeper understanding of who Jesus is. And Jesus is presented to us most clearly in Scripture. Now, here's the thing that I wasn't really doing when I was reading as well. When I was reading... Um, Where's my count? There it is. When I was reading scripture, I was reading it as though it were here. This is a this is a novel I'm reading right now. Um, if I'm if I was reading scripture, I would be reading it like I was reading any other book, um, just sort of letting it happen to me. What I want to suggest is, if the Bible is in fact the Word of God, if it's something that the Church has safeguarded for millennia because they, they felt that in its words god was revealing himself to us and speaking to us then what if we read the bible with that with the same awareness that god might be just around the corner every single time we read so right now we all have this awareness that covid might be around us why we're meeting online right now because uh covid is present and uh, the vast majority of people don't really want to fool around with the thing and get it, okay? So I wear masks. I've, I've got my vaccines. I'm loaded up. I'm, not, I'm still fairly confident I'm not going to get it. Maybe I'm naive, but I'm not, being a, I'm not being stupid about the thing either. I'm trying to be wise in how I approach this. I'm aware that COVID is hiding just around the corner in every context I meet, every person that I meet. So I want to encourage us to try and read scripture as though we are going to bump into God uh, just, to, just you know, in, in, in the next passage, just in the next page, just there's this anticipation we have when we read. And here's the thing, when we're reading this way, when we're being asked to read uh, really Jesus throughout history, that is not easy. Um, and it's also not even safe because I mean, it's a classic line. Every pastor has to use it one time or another, that idea of, of uh, C.S. Lewis's portrayal of God as Aslan. And um, Aslan is a lion, and they're concerned that he's a tame lion. They say, oh, he's not a tame lion, but he's good. He's dangerous, but he's good. He's still a lion, but he's good. Um, when God meets people in Scripture, 
things happen, change takes place. And so we should have uh, a suitably careful approach to scripture, um, recognizing that it's, it's a text where God is alive and waiting to confront us, waiting to meet us. Now you can see if you've got those uh, slot, the notes open, I've got another picture here, follows the same idea really. I've talked about the New Testament, but of course we have the New and the Old Testament. So I'm gonna copy it for you here. There we go. My amazing drawing skills. It's the exact same thing. Here, I've added in the Old Testament. I've added in, oh, that's a really anemic G down there. If we want to know who God is, God is revealed to us through the Old Testament, through the revelation of Jesus Christ as it's uh, told to us through the New Testament, and then carrying on through uh, Christian history, human history, to the point where we are now. The exact same thing takes place. And reading this way is definitely not easy or safe, and it takes time. And that's where I want you as young people to recognize that while things definitely feel like uh, the gas pedal is being pushed to the floor right now in your lives. Again, I've worked with students. Uh, being a student is a full-time job. Uh, it is a full-time job and then some, because a lot of you are working on top of this as well. And there's this immense pressure to know what you're going to do, uh, know how you're going to arrive there and do that. And there's this sort of undertone of, and why haven't you already reached that? And why aren't you already doing that? And so there's this immense pressure to make sure that you're getting it right. Scripture undermines all of that. Scripture says, slow down. God has given us, I'm not sure the Canadian averages right now, somewhere in the 80s. God has given us, let's say, 85 years on this earth. You have time breathe. When I look at my girls, my girls are 13, 9, and 7. When I look at my girls, I don't see little girls that are almost there, but really got to hurry up so that they get to be the way I hope that they will when they're older. No, I see these perfect, lovely, beautiful girls who are also going to grow up and just get better. It's the same thing with your own spiritual walk. You are perfect right now, and you will grow up. That is the gift, and that is the joy of growing up in Christ. God looks at you now, and he says, perfect. I love you. You are great just as you are. But guess what? Since you're still here, you're going to grow up, and you're only going to get better with age. So... If you want to grow up well, if you want to mature in your faith, then get to know God more. Get to know God revealed in Christ more by engaging with the word of God that we are privileged to be able to read and have at home, have on our phones, uh, having multiple versions of our Bible sometimes on our bookshelves. Take this and read. Little bit at a time but just read. Now, what does it mean to read wisely? Well, actually, let me first ask, um, I don't know if there's any footholds for any questions just yet, but does anybody have a question or anything that they'd like to ask or comment on or ask for clarity of? Um, I can only see myself. Uh, there, I've opened, I've opened the chat. So if you've got a question, um, you can write it in the chat. I am fairly good at multitasking, so I can uh, keep an eye on the chat um, and address that. Somebody here has written, uh, relationship, not religion. Yes, and is what I would say. Yes, and. I would argue that religion is actually important so long as it points to God. Now, religion doesn't do anything for God. It doesn't tickle God's religious bones. It's like, ooh, this feels so good. God says numerous times, 
I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I want you to look like me. I don't care how much religion you involve yourself with if it does nothing to shape you into a person that looks like me. Now, doing devotions, for example, is a religious practice. And it is a religious practice that can serve you very well if you engage with it in a way where you recognize the end goal of this is for me to look like God. And I don't look like God by just sitting here with my Bible uh, and reading. I look like God by taking this text and letting it work itself out through me as I engage with people in my day-to-day -day life. Am I engaged in matters of justice? Am I engaged in matters of mercy and grace? Do I love my neighbor the way I love myself? Where am I putting my time and my treasures, the resources that God has given me? Do I look like the God who made me? If your religious practices are helping you do that, then lean the heck into them, okay? At the end of the day, religion is just a, um, it's a branch of human culture that helps shape us towards something. As long as the thing that it is shaping toward, you towards is the living God, then it is a tool in your toolkit, a tool that God has given us, has given you to use as you're working towards him. The moment, however, that that religious practice becomes a little badge of honor that you can wear, uh, you can let people know just how much of the Bible you read or just how much you know or how often you spend in devotion, uh, you have wildly missed the point and are wasting not just your time, but God's time engaging in that kind of practice in that way. So um, yeah, the end goal of your reading is relationship. Your reading should be worked out in your relationships with others, but it is a religious practice that can serve you well if you're using it towards uh, the right ends. Now, what does it actually look like to read wisely? Because anybody can read. A lot of people read in ways that uh, ultimately aren't all that helpful. For example, there's a number of Christians who talk about reading the Bible literally, but what they mean when they say reading the Bible literally is, the Bible says what I think it says, and what you think it says is wrong, unless it lines up with what I think it says. Uh, that is not what we mean by reading the Bible literally. So what I want to uh, give you here is some, some ways and practices that can help you do that. Uh, somebody's written a great question here. It kind of ties into where we're going, asking uh, what kinds of things are important to read, what are good resources to engage with, uh, post-New Testament church, et cetera. Anything and everything, honestly. Uh, I would, if you want to read something, I don't have my copy here, but the Apostolic Fathers are really great to read. They're the people that were alive just after the writers of the New Testament. The church didn't stop writing letters to each other after Paul or Peter or John. They kept on writing letters to each other and keep on writing letters to each other. Um, we'll get into that right now, actually. When you're reading the Bible for what it says, when you're reading the Bible, trying to understand what the Bible says, actually, there's three things that you want to be paying attention to. First, you want to, be ta you want to pay attention to the fact that there is a world in front of the text. That when you are sitting down to read your Bible, you are coming to scripture with a specific set of experiences, understandings, biases, etc. You're coming with a cultural context, with a community context, um, with all these things that you might not even know you have, but they're there. It is very important to be aware of those things insofar as you're able, as you're reading scripture. Again, this is not something that you're going to do the very first time. You're going to be aware of them as you read over time. But this is uh, something that most people actually get tripped up on right out of the gate. For example, you don't have to look far, that far back in church history to recognize that a lot of Christians used their Bible 
to um, affirm and confirm their views on slavery. The Bible said exactly what they needed it to say to make them feel good about the decisions that they were making. They were completely blind to their world in front of the text. They weren't aware of what their biases were. They weren't aware of what their community's questions were or needs were. They just assumed that the Bible was speaking directly to them and patting them on the head and giving them a cookie, okay? It's very helpful to, to recognize, for me, for example, when I read my Bible, I am reading it as a white male in North America. I cannot understand my Bible as a woman in North America, white, visible minority, invisible minority or otherwise, I can only come to it with uh, a male perspective. So if I want to open my eyes to a better or a, a well-rounded understanding of scripture, it is imperative for me to, uh, to make sure that my community that I am talking about scripture with includes women. And that as I read scripture and they read scripture, when they tell me their experience with it, I listen. I don't try and steamroll them with my understanding, but I listen to theirs and try and understand how theirs might inform mine, undermine mine, challenge mine, confirm mine, whatever the case may be. The world in front of the text is massive. It's massive. You, you can constantly find places where you've got blinders on, where you just assumed everyone did this this way. Uh, James and I both had the advantage of being at Regent. And one of the neat things about Regent and UBC, for that matter, nowadays, is the international community that you have there. And I remember there was a student in one of my classes who was giving his opinion. I think the better term would be gifting his opinion to the class and uh, a student from Ethiopia stood up and very firmly but politely said, what you're saying would not work in Ethiopia, and so it is not the gospel. And he sat down. And uh, my teacher just burst out laughing because this poor North American Christian just got zinged by this guy who understood the world better than he did, that not everyone's experience is the cushy North American experience. Um, and it was this wonderful moment of realizing how much we tack onto scripture that is actually cultural baggage. Uh, so reading the world in front of the text means paying attention to that cultural baggage, that personal baggage, and that baggage can be good, can be bad, but being aware of what that stuff is when you're sitting down to read. Now, there's also the world behind the text. And if the world in front of the text is you and your world, then the world behind the text is them and their world, meaning the people that the text is referencing or the people that, the, that were involved in the creation of the text. So if you're looking at 1 Corinthians here, the people behind the text really are the Corinthians themselves. It's really helpful to understand what the uh, Corinthian city was like what the Corinthian people were wrestling with at the time, um, to ask yourself, why are the issues that Paul is raising these particular issues and not other issues? Am I hearing this text in a way that is um, sensitive to the actual situation in life that the Corinthian people themselves were dealing with? Or, world in front of the text again, am I importing something else? I'm imp am I importing something into the text? But there's a great question here. It's about the Old Testament, but it lines up with the New Testament stuff here as well. It says, our current state is so different from the culture in the Old Testament that I find it difficult to make sense of at times. For example, justifying mass destruction of people groups. Absolutely. This is exactly the kind of thing that we need to be paying attention to. So I can answer that specific question. Um, it's not necessarily helpful, but it lets us know why they wrote the way they did. So when it comes to mass violence, for example, and the Bible is, don't listen to, um, oh, I was just about to say mainstream media. Don't be that guy, Levi. Uh, but, the, the, but there's this cultural narrative in Western news outlets that Islam and the Quran um, are inherently violent. 
Uh, I am an Orthodox Christian, a Bible thumping Christian, but I've read the Quran and our Bible is far more violent than the Quran. If we're being honest, if we're going story for story, blow for blow, there's a lot more violence in our uh, scripture than there is in the Quran. So what in the world do we do with this? Well, first of all, I think it's important with the Old Testament to recognize why people wrote the way that they wrote. And right off the bat, we have to recognize that when they're talking about battles and fighting and things like this, they're not trying to pump their tires so much as they're trying to pump the tires of the God that they worship. And so if I get in a fist fight with James nowadays, uh, James and I are both a little worse for the wear. Maybe James is better off than I am. But uh, the way that I tell people about it is, oh, yeah, James and I got in a fight. I might say, oh, you should see the other guy. But it's a general journalistic approach of what happened. Now, let's say James and I are nation states and we have a fight in Old Testament times. It's not enough simply to say, uh, yeah, we traded blows. Half of their guys died, like a third of our guys died. It wasn't great. No, no, no. That doesn't signal a decisive victory for your God. So what they would do, and it's not just Israel, what every people group in the Mediterranean basin did was they would say, yes, I went to war against James and I erased James and his family and everything that has breath in James nation from the earth. I ground them beneath me uh, with my heel. We obliterated them. We even killed their children and pregnant women. Often, though, in those texts in scripture, when you read a few verses later, it says, and then we took the survivors and we uh, made a deal with them that they would live over here, we would live over there, and we married their people and they married ours, and we trade horses with them ever since. And you feel like, well, wait a second, either they all died or they didn't. What's actually happening here? Add to that the fact that sometimes these battles aren't even battles, <laughs> so to speak. I mean, we've got uh, evidence from the Babylonians, for example, that they um, faced the Israelites and wiped them from the face of the earth so that no living thing was left. And you're like, well, that's obviously not true. The Israelites are still kicking around today. So what are you trying to do here? What they were trying to do was pump up their God as saying, our God is obviously greater than yours because we won the day. So much so that you might as well not even exist right now. Now, that still begs the question, why is God asking people to fight people? Um, in the Old Testament. And that is something I am not going to get into right now tonight. Although it's like a super like bait and switch on you. I'm so sorry. But that is something that we have to wrestle with in the world behind the text. What is actually happening with these people groups? What is going on? How come, as many people observe, the God of the New Testament seems so different from the God of, say, uh, Joshua or uh, Numbers or Deuteronomy. I would argue you have to hold those tensions in place. You can't erase one for the sake of the other. You need to hold those tensions in place and let them be resolved over time. That is a very difficult thing to ask somebody to do, and I am aware of that. Um, but it is the safest bet for you to do. I'll get to that in a little bit as to why. There's also the world in the text. Now, when I say the world in the text, what I mean is the words, the plot points, the characters, et cetera, of the text itself. What is actually happening here. A great thing to do if you're reading the New Testament is to look at how the New Testament reads the Old Testament. That's very instructive, very instructive, actually. But it's really important to recognize that uh, one of the things I've actually gotten in the habit of doing even is when I talk about Jesus in Mark, what I'll often actually say is Mark's Jesus, because Mark's Jesus is very different, for example, than Matthew's Jesus. Mark's Jesus is emotional and impulsive and secretive, and Matthew's Jesus is talkative, uh, confrontational, but not so emotional as Mark's Jesus. 
because as Mark writes his story about who Jesus is, he has certain ideas in mind that he is trying to communicate to his readers. Matthew has competing interests, not that he is trying to say Mark is wrong, but he's read Mark and says, mm, brilliant stuff, Mark. I think there's more to it, though. And he, he adds his piece to the picture. Luke does the same. John does the same. And the church, the church looks at this. And by the way, there are that we know of 60 plus gospels that were written, different names attached to them. The church has looked at all of these gospels and it doesn't say only one story can be true. It says we need actually a handful of these things to capture who Jesus was as we understood and experienced him. And so they take four. Uh, people will often say, oh, there's uh, uh, inconsistencies between the stories in scripture that undermine the whole thing, as though the people who took these four stories and, and agreed upon them weren't like we're, uh, we're, we're not aware of these inconsistencies and undermine their whole project. No, they're aware of the tensions that they create, but they're also aware that without these tensions in place, you don't have a full picture of who Jesus is. You need all four of these gospels. Um, to capture who Jesus was and is for the people of God today. And so they take those four things. Um, when I hear people talk about inconsistencies in the Gospels, I usually think, boy, it took you that long to notice? They're not that hard to spot. Uh, maybe the better question might be, how come people who share the same desires that we have today, that is, they don't want to be lied to and they don't want to be fleeced by someone, how come these people nevertheless Um, that would be lost if Mark were missing, or Luke were missing, or John were missing, for example. So the world in front of the text, the world behind the text, and the world in the text are these three worlds that you want to be paying attention to. And yes, when you're talking about the differences in culture, I am very glad that you bring that up, Conrad, because too often people approach scripture as though their neighbor, who they share a whole bunch of assumptions with, wrote the thing and they can understand it implicitly. Um, there are going to be sections that you read in 1 Corinthians that will have you scratching your head <laughs> that you won't be able to answer very easily. For example, when Paul talks about their practice of baptizing people, baptizing people on behalf of the dead. That's an odd one that is never explained in any other part of Scripture. We are just left to sit with that. Um, it helps immensely if you understand, if you grow in your understanding of the culture and times and circumstances in which these texts were written, it will help you immensely. Now, not everyone has the time to read books on Mesopotamia or books on Egyptian culture, etc. cetera. Um, but if you can, and that tickles your fancy, awesome. If you don't have that time, then read people as you're able who did have the time and can speak to those things for you um, because that can be really helpful. And for some people that actually really helps to save and transform their understanding of how things are moving forward. But here's the thing. Most of the time people stop right here. They, they look at the Bible as this historical text sort of frozen in time. And they're trying to suss out what the right reading is when actually we're also called to read the Bible for what it might also say. So this is that idea of saying, okay, I understand now what Paul has been writing to the Corinthians, I think, insofar as I'm able to understand that, I understand it. There's still that all-important question of what does this letter written 2,000 years ago have to say to me in Kelowna? Maybe you're a person who's come from out of province. Maybe you're a person who's come from out of the country, and you're in this new cultural context, and you're trying to figure this out. What does Corinthians say to me here? Well, this is where we're trying to actually move beyond what has been said in scripture. And we're actually trying to interpret. Now, when I say moving beyond, you'll see in the little thing, where I say moving beyond, but staying within. Because God is the same now and forever. All we are trying to do is understand if God was experienced this way and wrestled with in this way, uh, in scripture, how might I wrestle with God now 
in my context. You know, I wrestle with, um, I don't know, say you're uh, a big gamer, you love watching Twitch, you're on Twitch all the time. Uh, your addiction to Twitch or to video games is not a thing that is going to be talked about in scripture. You can search high and low. There is no third Corinthians that says, oh, by the way, about gaming, and then writes you know, a, little bit, a little treatise on that. You're not going to find it. That's up to you to translate this story into your culture. You can't do that on your own, and you can't just do it by thinking of the thing. You have to try and engage with your fellow community of believers and put different approaches into practice to see what kind of fruit they bear. You have to read the text for what it also might say. It's also helpful in this regard to read the story in light, uh, to, to, to read the Bible in light of where the story is going. You know, we've got Genesis to um, Hebrews, or Jude, I should say. Um, that covers one stretch. That's mostly past. Revelation seems to be speaking towards the future, and we are here smack in the middle. So we know where the story has been. It's really helpful for us to know where the story is going. Uh, and there's an author, many of you might know him, his name is N.T. Wright. He has a great, uh, a great metaphor for how we as Christians engage with scripture and engage with our life. He says, think of the Bible as a script to a play. We have the first four acts in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, we'll just call it four acts. He names what they are. That's not important to the metaphor. They're the first four acts. We've also got the last act, the sixth act in Revelation, how the whole story is going to be wrapped up with the creation of new heavens and new earth and God being reunited with his people and in all his glory and splendor. That's the sixth act. But we are in the fifth act. And darn it, we don't have a script. All we have is the first four acts and the last act. But the show must go on. So what do you do if you're a drama nerd and you're in a play and you're in the fifth act and you don't have a script? Well, it makes no sense for you to try and recreate exactly what happened in the first four acts. This is where we talked about not conforming to scripture. You don't also jump ahead to the sixth act because you're not there yet. That's not your part of the script. Somebody has nailed it in the chat. You improvise. You look at where the story has been and you look at where the story is going and you interpret your role in the play. The show must go on. I've seen where things are. I'm sorry, where things have been. I see where it's going. What am I being called to now in this fifth act? How do I carry this story along, recognizing that the whole thing doesn't rest on me? God is the author of this play. It's going where he wants it to go, but I have to play my part. Improvisation is absolutely the word of the day. And that's, again, where this comes from needing to um, read uh, to, to, to move beyond what scripture says and apply it or interpret it into our present day situation. Again, moving beyond not in the sense that scripture is useless for us, but looking at scripture as a lens that we are looking through into our present circumstance. And we do all of this finally, because we are trying to read what it says about your life now. This is actually a very hard thing to say, okay, but what about me? And I see two names. I see Bethany Hebert and I see Jezreel Escobar on here. So what does it mean for you, Bethany, and for you, Jezreel, to, to take what you've read and live that out? Because no interpretation of scripture is complete until you have worked it out in your life, in your lived life. If you're reading scripture and going, mm, interesting, and then putting it down and going about your day as though nothing has changed, you are doing it wrong. But if you read scripture and over time come to understand that God is a God of mercy and justice, and you are created in his image, how then do you live a life that is marked by mercy and justice? You are now obligated to work that out in your day um, and time. 
That's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Again, this is not safe and it's not easy. The Bible asks you to change. It asks you to conform to the image of God, not to the you know, image of a first century Jew or a Gentile Christian. You are conforming to the image of God. You're modeling these believers as they were doing the exact same thing. And you're saying, okay, so what do I do here? How do I work this out? How do I live this out? Again, too often people will read, uh, actually James and I were talking about this uh, before this whole thing started. We were talking about medically assisted death, uh, medically assisted suicide, an enormously complex issue. And one that isn't really boldly addressed in scripture. But even if it were boldly addressed in scripture, it still is um, an instruction given to a first century context. We have to wrestle with what that, uh, with what that instruction might mean for us today. So for example, there are countless, countless instructions in scripture that we are breaking right now. If you have clothes with two blends of fabric in them, you are breaking the Torah right now. Now we would say, yes, but that's old and not new. And I would say, well, how does the instruction on the Sabbath differ? The instruction to observe Sabbath is also old and not new. So how do we make sure that we're not just cherry picking the things that we like versus the things that we don't like and doing kind of like a, uh, paint by numbers Christianity, where we're making our own thing. You have to wrestle with these and recognize if I'm called to be to look like Christ, what do I do with these texts? How do I wrestle with these things so that I might um, model Christ best in my day and life? Now, the great thing is, is that First Corinthians actually tackles this kind of question head on when Paul is asking, "What about?" meat sacrificed to idols what what do i do with meat sacrificed to idols and here's the thing to remember this is a cultural context thing in the ancient world when you went to buy meat the only place you are buying meat is from a temple that's it temples were the 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 um equivalent of modern day butcher shops you want meat you go to a temple they're asking the question because Every single bit of meat they're eating is meat that has been sacrificed to idols. And so what do we do? This is an enormously complicated question that Paul doesn't just turn to Old Testament texts for. He turns to the character of God and spends, you'll see, a good chunk of chapters wrestling with that. And the, 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 the framework that Paul seems to rest on is... Um, on the one hand, the freedom we have in Christ, but on the other, the freedom that Christ gave up by allowing himself to be crucified on a cross. So Jesus Christ crucified is really the lens that he looks at this through. And even though he agrees with one side, he disagrees with their approach. And he unpacks that for you. It's a really great text to see how Paul is translating the text. He's not just following a given instruction in Torah. He's interpreting it to their context to show them how they might live their life faithfully, how they might model Christ in this spot without um, making a mistake or stepping on somebody's toes. Now, here's the thing. When you are reading Corinthians, not every text is going to support every one of these approaches to, to, to reading. Um, that's not how texts work. If I'm reading my novel here, as interesting as the first couple of sentences might be, they're not nearly as important, say, as the sentences at the end of that chapter, which move on to the next bit. And those sentences aren't nearly as important as the climax of the novel, which I am almost at, I'm almost there, everything's coming to a head. Those are the really important bits. You're gonna have the same thing in scripture. You're gonna have words that are building up to a thing, words where Paul has reached the climax of his argument, and not every bit of scripture is going to be able to answer all of these questions. But these are tools that you have in your toolkit as you're reading slowly and patiently, recognizing always when you read that you could be wrong. And here's what I want to end with. Avoid the tyranny of being right. 
this is the most distracting thing in the world when you're reading. When people read scripture, they are deathly afraid of getting it wrong. They are deathly afraid of getting it wrong and what that might mean. And so people are constantly needling and trying to find the right answer. Try not to worry about that. Don't worry about what the right reading is because you will never know if it was the right reading anyways. Uh, we have a limited uh, sense of understanding when it comes to the world as it is. At the end of the day, and again, Corinthians is all about this, reading the Bible is not about intellectual information. It is about growing up in love. And the great thing is, is that being wrong can make you right sometimes. So I want to tell you a story from Psalm 102. Psalm 102 is a psalm talking about uh, Jerusalem, uh, the land being laid waste, and it's a place now only for lonely birds, for owls. Except Augustine, one of our church fathers, he was around in the 300s and 400s. When Augustine was translating this, he didn't translate the word owl as owl. He translated it as pelican. Okay, so already he's, he's gone far off the rails. Now, he translates it as pelican, but he's feeling like, okay, the, the problem here is I don't have a clue about pelicans. So he writes his friend, Jerome. Jerome is also a church father, really important figure in, in Christian history. And Jerome says, uh, <laughs> very confidently and very wrong, he says, oh, I know all about pelicans. Pelicans are this interesting animal, Augustine. Let me tell you about them. Pelicans, they have their chicks. And as soon as their chick is hatched from the egg, they immediately kill the chick. Then after having killed the chick, they pierce themselves with their beak and let their blood wash over their dead chick and their blood revives the dead chick and brings it back to life. Now, Augustine is a smart enough guy to know this sounds kind of fishy. I don't know pelicans, but it seems a bit odd that this is the approach they would take. At the same time, though, Augustine says this is a brilliant picture of how our relationship with God has worked. We have sinned against God, and so God has punished us. We're like this dead chick. We've hatched, and God killed us right at the gate. It's a bit harsh, but roll with Augustine here. But then... Through his son, whose pierced side on the cross, uh, his blood spills over us, and we are revived and made alive again in Christ. Holy smokes, I think Christ is our divine pelican. And then, I kid you not, for the next, oh, thousand years, the church clings to the pelican as a symbol for Jesus. Thomas Aquinas has beautiful prayers to Jesus, our pelican. If you go to um, any old universities, especially in France, you'll often see pelicans on the archways of the doors because it's Christ the divine pelican hovering over us. The French monarchy ended up taking the pelican as their, the, the bird on their royal seal because they got all colonialist trying to get religion and their imperial power mixing. That's how it happened. Um, so they adopt the pelican as their seal. The pelican eventually makes its way to Louisiana as the bird on its license plate because of the French history in Louisiana. And all of this comes from misreading owl as pelican in the Psalms. Now, here's the question. Is that reading wrong? On the one hand, 100%. It's an owl, it's not a pelican. On the other hand, in his mistranslation of this word, Augustine rightly recognizes that the picture that this text presents to them very much lines up with the character of God, and it's all he's got. He has to trust his friend Jerome, who, know, who knows about pelicans, and so he does this. He says, well, I'll roll with this, even though I think it's wrong, it's all I've got. And so I will pray this out and live this out because the reading as my friend Jerome has given it to me sure sounds a lot like Jesus. Uh, piercing himself for our sakes that we might have life again. It was only when Martin Luther was translating the Bible in the 1500s that he went, what the heck? There is no pelican in Jerusalem. This is 100% 
an owl and translates it rightly. What I'm trying to say is, for a thousand years, the church didn't even know it was wrong, and yet that incorrect reading of scripture served as this powerful image and icon for them in understanding who Jesus was. They weren't wrong in that. So don't stress about whether or not you're reading a text exactly right. At the end of the day, the measure for your right reading is whether or not um, that reading of scripture lines up with the character of God. And as you work that scripture out in your life, it lines up with the character of God and the fruit of the spirit. That's the only thing that you can measure it by. And so don't worry about getting it right. It's the wrong thing to stress about. And you've got lots of time to get things right. Now, I've given you guys a few things uh, for help here. I've given you a Bible study thing, with already which I already mentioned. But I've also given you a Corinthians cheat sheet where I tried to do some of the background heavy lifting for you. Because I know that you've got a lot of reading. Uh, I've got a commentary on um, Corinthians. It's not here. Uh, this book on Corinthians to help you understand Corinthians is 1,400 pages long. I'm pretty sure no, no one has the time to read that right now. So I have gone through a few books and I've given you some background information that might give you some historical context as to what's going on in uh, Corinth when Paul is writing this. Okay. So I give you some of that information. Then I also give you something I call the big picture made small, which is kind of a snapshot of Paul's letter, letting you know how the thing works. You know, he's got his greeting and Thanksgiving. Um, then he starts to go into a, addressing divisions over who is wisest. Uh, he responds to matters he's heard about from Chloe's household, and then to things he's heard about in a letter from them. You see the big picture made small right there, okay? Then for the next nine pages, so this might be a bit of a fire hose, but for the next five pages, I have actually outlined the entire letter with a little bit more detail. Now, this is in my own words, and I didn't, uh, I didn't do a second take. All I did was I clicked on the red words to make sure that my spelling wasn't embarrassing when I passed this off to you guys, but I haven't edited or revised this. This is just my first take reading Corinthians all the way through. What am I seeing and how am I seeing that? This can be really handy when you're looking at a text, say, in 1 Corinthians 13, which is quoted at so many weddings, all about love. Um, it's helpful to understand that Paul is actually talking about how the people in Corinth uh, comport themselves when they are in a worship service and how they should be treating the exercising of their spiritual gifts in the context of a worship service. That's actually where this text on the way of love and desiring and exercising the gifts comes from. So it gives you a bit of like context at a glance as you're reading. And I know we're at 8.30 right now, but I did want to speak to one thing in here uh, as an example of the kind of tricky pieces that can come up. I'm not sure if you're looking at the same page that I am, but I'm looking at page 10 of the Corinthians cheat sheet. If you don't have it open, don't worry about it. I will speak it to you now. Um, there's a text in 1 Corinthians that talks about how uh, women should be silent in the churches, that they shouldn't talk, they should let the men do the talking, they should keep quiet. It's important for you to know that scholarship is in a twist over this one, because the text itself, 1434 to 35, is inconsistent with the rest of what Paul has said in this letter. Paul has already talked about how women prophesy, about how women speak in churches, about how women should have the chance to speak in churches in the same way that men speak in churches. He's already said this. So to say a few chapters later that they shouldn't speak doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So there are a number of scholars who believe that verses 34 and 35 are actually a scribe who has written something in because even he's a little bit shamefaced at how uh, egalitarian Paul is in this stretch here. And the reason that they think that and can say that so confidently, it might sound, is because if you don't read verses 34 and 35, 
the text makes a lot of sense. So I am going to read this for you right now. Paul is talking about my NIV just says good order in worship, which is as good a little headline as any. So he says two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, this first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turns so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is a, not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Or did the word of the God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anyone thinks they are a prophet or otherwise gifted by the spirit, let them acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is the Lord's command. Now, I just jumped over verses 34 and 35. Verses 34 and 35 are this odd little addition. Um, in my Bible, it even says in a few manuscripts, these verses come after verse 40. They're texts that float around. Now, here's the thing. We have a few texts that are like this in the Bible. The woman who's stoned for adultery, that's a text that doesn't uh, appear um in our earliest manuscripts the ending of the gospel of mark doesn't appear in our earliest manuscripts when you're thinking about the bible recognize that you're thinking about a fuzzy category because when you're talking about the bible that you read the bible you read is slightly different than the bible that catholics read or lutherans read or anglicans read or coptic christians read or eastern orthodox christians read it's got these fuzzy boundaries to the thing okay that is okay that is how god has willed it to be again being wrong on the uh some of these particulars doesn't mean that you are wrong and uh screwed from the get-go it means you have to read wisely and read carefully and read prayerfully and be engaged in conversation with your fellow brothers and sisters in christ as you read i wanted to mention that though because it does uh pop up and it's one of those texts of terror that i have found a lot of guys don't tend to think too much about um but when a woman who feels strongly the call of god in her life to preach or teach comes across a text like that that kind of takes the wind out of you that kind of takes you out at the knees and that's a hard one to wrestle with and so we have to recognize that there are some texts of terror out there that have to be grappled with and we can't deal with those things offhand. We have to have our extraordinary graphic to recognize that there's a lot going on here that we have to read and wrestle with. And the point isn't to arrive at some magical confirmed destination, but to engage faithfully on the journey um, as we are conformed to the person of Christ. That's what we're called to do. Now, the last comment I see here is that Shakespeare was right, all the world's a stage. Yes, the bard is correct. But I'm wondering, now that I have talked nonstop for an hour and a bit, I'm wondering if there are any questions, any other questions that you guys might have. Um, and I'll even be so bold as to say, you can turn off your microphone and just speak them if that's faster for you. Because we could talk about this endlessly, really. There's a lot to go on. I'm changing to gallery view so I can see you all sit awkwardly silent, wondering who's going to ask the first question. Or when is Levi going to catch the drift that no one has a question to ask? Why can't we move on? Any advice you have for living with cognitive dissonance and being okay with being wrong? Oh, my goodness. Yes. <laughs> this is an extremely hard thing. When you're, I mean, you guys are all in school right now learning is about encountering cognitive dissonance over and over and over again your cage gets rattled a little bit but not enough that you get super anxious just enough that it prompts you to to open up to something being other than what you thought it was before sometimes though our cage gets rattled to such a degree that it rocks us to our core and anxiety tanks takes over and we don't know what to do with what we've just heard. So um, 
we'll pick an easy one here. Maybe it's not an easy one for you, but some people really struggle with the notion that Genesis, for example, might not be about the mechanical causation of how Earth came to be. And when they hear that there are other ways of reading it, that sets their back rigid and makes them deeply uncomfortable as though the entire gospel is being thrown out the window, okay? I recognize that is very profoundly difficult for some people. And it might be whatever uh, thing you think. For some people, it's about whether men or women uh, can share leadership in the church. That's a, a hill that they aren't willing to give up. That's where they'll die. And they feel like they're dying when somebody comes along and says, well, I feel called to be a pastor and I'm a woman. And if you can't support me, then we've got a problem. This is where, again, Reading scripture should foster and cultivate humility because you will encounter texts that you do not know what to do with. Again, those texts of uh, violence in the Old Testament, you won't know what to do with those texts. And by not reconciling that right away, you are practicing being in that liminal space where you are not in control. You are extending grace to, to scripture uh, scripture that you don't understand. Now, let's say James is a young earth fanatic, and I am a uh, science fanatic. I'm all about evolution, and he's all about young earth creation. What both of us have to do, and it is extremely hard, but what both of us have to do is recognize that either of us could be wrong. We could be wrong. And at the end of the day, <laughs> flat earth fanatic, no, <laughs> you are wrong. What you have to do is figure out how can I live with this person without throttling them because I think they're an idiot. How do I do that? And this is when you start to realize, you know what, I might have to pick up a, a posture of prayer towards this person because I can't change my mind about this thing. And again, this comes back to practice. You can't just flip a switch. You actually have to engage in some kind of practice that can help you view that person in a different light. This is why we say try and pray for those people who you have disagreements with or have a hard time thinking uh, highly of. Patiently pray for that person, not that they would change, but that they would have a good rest tonight and delight in God's creation tomorrow. Pray for them, recognizing that you could be wrong and they could be wrong, whether or not they are willing to recognize that in you. You might be very generous and say, well, I could be wrong. And they could say, yes, yes, you are wrong and I am correct. And nothing makes you want to pop somebody in the face more than them saying that to you and you're trying to be all generous and <laughs> congenial but there's a great line from um from oh shoot i blanked in his name the guy who wrote the man who was thursday george mcdonald there's a great quote by uh george mcdonald he's a christian writer before c.s lewis he said that christianity hasn't so much been tried and found wanting, but found hard and left untried. This is again where scripture is not safe to read. It asks you to do things that are hard to make space for a person you disagree with. Um, but I'm also a person, I recognize that these cognitive dissonance things, they itch. I can't help it. I want to scratch them. Um, I have, James is right, I read a lot. Uh, my personal library between my wife and I, we've got a little over 3,000 books. And I, I buy books. I, I wanted a job where I would have a book budget. And so I've only worked in places where I have a book budget. And then I read those things voraciously. Um, read. Read books, but make sure that you're not reading in isolation. Make sure that you're not reading things and here's a book, uh, The Death of the Messiah and the Birth of the New Covenant, a not so new model of the atonement. 
when I read this book, I need to make sure that I'm not reading Michael Gorman as a person who is absolutely right. Of course, he's going to sound right. He's got a book and he's bringing his arguments that make sense in his head. But I'm reading somebody, a fellow believer or not, perhaps, who is in conversation with a text that is vitally important to my life. So I'm going to read this and I'm going to bring this up in conversation with other authors or with my community of people. And we're going to talk about this and talk about what the implications of what I've read might mean. What are the implications of me suggesting that chapter 14 verses 34 and 35 in 1 Corinthians perhaps ought to be regarded as a later edition? What might that mean? Um, there are so many books out there that you can read. I can't even begin to recommend people because there's great books that I don't even know exist. But uh, what you can do, James is a smart guy. James and I went to the same school. Ask James for authors. Ask James if the book you're reading or want to look at is worth looking at or reading. Ask him if he knows the person whose video you're watching on YouTube is and if, you, uh, if he can suss something out for you. Ask me to do that for you. I would love to. Uh, there's lots of good stuff out there, but again, you're not panicking so much about worrying about whether something is right, especially if you are in a community of believers who is bringing this stuff up and talking about it, not regarding it as something embarrassing and shameful um, and old fashioned, but just a part of your life. I read scripture and I let it read me. Um, and not feeling like you have to be able to answer people's questions when they try and ambush you with some kind of attack. Uh, How's that for an answer to cognitive dissonance? Okay. I thought the earth was dinosaur shaped. Conrad, you are wrong. <laughs> um, any other questions? Anything at all? <laughs> it's just easier if I like say this no one's yep. typing so when we're reading like other books that aren't necessarily like first corinthians where we got this big you know yeah. document for us how do we like how are we able to find and properly like exegesis what we're reading if we don't have all this time to read commentaries and and get that context of like yeah. where it's coming from um <laughs> the answer slowly uh, one of the things I would recommend trying, and this is actually why I gave you the, the document that I did, is when you're reading, try and pay attention to how what you're reading works. So for example, I've bracketed off, uh, well, it starts off with Paul introducing himself, the recipients of the Corinthians, he does some greetings. And I try and break down how the letter works as a letter. Where is Paul shifting gears in his thinking? Why might Paul be shifting his gears in his thinking in that spot? Let the text generate an endless stream of questions, okay? There was a lady in our church. Uh, she's got to be in her 60s, but she has a middle school education. She stopped going to the school in grade eight. She was uh, working with the family. And when she reads her Bible, she reads her Bible with a box of recipe cards. And as she reads, when a text jumps out at her, for whatever reason, it could be because it's confusing or it doesn't make sense or because it feels good to her, she would write it down on a recipe card, okay? Then she would take that recipe card and pray about what she had read and then pay attention for how her life that week might inform what she had read. And if it did, she would write down on her card how it helped or what she might have experienced. Okay. So she showed me, she's been doing this for years. She showed me all these boxes of, of recipe cards and texts and prayers and questions. Half of the things are unanswered, half the things are answered. This is a woman with a grade eight education who constantly was telling me, I'm a simple woman, I'm a simple woman. And she is, uh, she is a simple woman. But man, 
what a good practice. <laughs> uh, I guarantee you that there are aspects of scripture she understands better than a person who has spent time digging into cultural and historical context. Because as I was hearing her talk about scripture, I was realizing that she had better insights than I did into some of these things because she had spent her life paying far more attention to the voice of God than what a given text might mean. She would often say, oh, I was reading this bit in Mark and I have no idea what he's on about, but I feel like, and then she would give me what she felt like. And was it right? I don't know, but boy, it sounded like God. Boy, it sounded like God. And that is a really hard thing for us to make space for because our culture doesn't make a lot of room for that. Our culture believes that there is a right answer and a wrong answer. What is the right answer? How do I spend the time to find that? And that's actually why a lot of people, I think, don't bother engaging with scripture. It's because they're both embarrassed with what they find there and they're embarrassed with their lack of understanding of what to do with what they found. What you have to do often is like Timothy Keller said in his book is wait a few years, is be patient. Trust that for 2000 years, just speaking about the New Testament, for 2000 years, the church has said yes and amen to these texts. People just like you and me have said yes and amen to these texts. Now I come along and I have to recognize I'm putting some faith in the people who put this text in my hand. I need to spend some time sitting with this. Now, if you want to go and chase things down, yeah, there's great things you can find. I, again, I'll point you to people who know uh, where those texts are. Talk to James. My email is Levi, my name, L-E-V-I, at kgfchurch.com. I'm, hold on. I am like you, Aliyah. I'm assuming that you're not Amanda in the conversation here. Um, <laughs> yes. I'm like you. I like to know that, though. I want to know that. And I would still say be patient. You need to be patient, and you need to let things take the time they take. But know that if you want, there is a 1,400-page book on Corinthians just waiting for you to crack it open and see what it's on about. There's stuff out there that is really good to look at. And it's always worth remembering that it's not a bunch of um, redneck yokels that are saying yes and amen to scripture. It is people with multiple PhDs, with multiple uh, philosophical um, credentials behind their names, et cetera, who are also saying yes and amen to this. And so just like I trust my mechanic, because as far as I'm concerned, cars work by magic, sometimes you have to trust the people who say this is a trustworthy text. And then say to yourself, yes, and one day I will see why you say that, because I'm not going to be satisfied until I figure that out for myself. I totally get that. Um, takes time. Yes, I love it, James. Trust me. <laughs> it's the hardest thing in the world to do, and I was so dissatisfied with trusting people uh, that I went and spent nine years of post-secondary education trying to answer some of those things. Um, and then you come that's, back and you go that's what multiple master's degrees really sums yes, up is it? Yes. trust me <laughs> um, yeah it can be hard to do that it can be hard Yeah. and well, again I, I can't answer this in one evening unfortunately but that's why I try and say uh, I'm game to have these conversations with you if you want to have them that's what a pastor is for to have these kinds of conversations thank you so much Levi and yeah, uh, thank you for um, making yourself available. And that's what's great is that Levi's not, uh, you know, zooming in here from the UK or anything. He's just down the road. I'm in Kelowna. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, appreciate all the time that you put into um, also the gift of those notes. And for those of you who are interested in that, if you didn't get a chance to download that, I'll, uh, I'll maybe post that link one last time because I know if you show up late, you don't get the link. Uh, so there it is one more last time. But uh, let's give uh, Levi a round of applause, a silent applause. <laughs> you don't get to hear it, but you got to see it. Um, thank you so much, Levi. That was amazing.